You're listening to The Corbett Report. This is the story of Stefan Westman, a corporal in the German 29th Division, about his experience in the trenches. <clears throat> One day we got orders to storm a French position. We got in and my comrades fell right and left of me, but then I was confronted by a French corporal. He with his bayonet at the ready and, my, and I with my bayonet at the ready. For a moment I felt the fear of death, and in a fraction of a second I realized that he was after my life exactly as I was after his. I was quicker than he was. I tossed his rifle away and I ran my bay bayonet through his chest. He fell, put his hand on the place where I, I had hit him, and then I thrust again. Blood came out of his mouth and he died. I felt physically ill. I nearly vomited. My knees were shaking and I was quite frankly ashamed of myself. My comrades, I was a corporal, uh, my comrades, I was a corporal there then, were absolutely undisturbed by what had happened. One of them boasted that he had killed a poilu with the butt of his rifle. Another one had strangled a captain, a French captain. A third one had hit somebody over the head with his spade and they were ordinary men like me. One of them was a tram conductor, another one a commercial traveler, two were students, the rest were farm workers, ordinary people who never would have thought to do any harm to anyone. How did it come about that they were so cruel? I remembered then that we were told that the good soldier kills without thinking of his adversary as a human being. The very moment he sees in him a fellow man, he is not a good soldier anymore. But I had in front of me the dead man, the dead French soldier, and how would I like to have, ha have him raised his hand? I would have shaken his hand and we would have been the best of friends because he was, like me, nothing but a poor boy who had to fight who had to go in with the most cruel weapons against a man who had nothing against him personally, who only wore the uniform of another nation, who spoke another language, but a man who had a father and mother and a family, perhaps, and so I felt. This is not an uncommon experience that we encounter in the stories of the people, the pawns, the cannon fodder that fought, that actually fought and died and spilled their blood in the trenches in World War I. There was Alan Bray of the Wiltshire Regiment. Uh, in July 1915, he was detailed to a firing squad to execute a deserter. He refused to do so. He said, I thought that I knew why these men had deserted. I understood their feelings and what would make them desert. This is what the powers that shouldn't be actually fear. What if they held a war and nobody came? What if they refused to fight? There's no way to get accurate numbers on this because, of course, the British Army or any other army didn't want them to be recorded, let alone reported. But we do know that there were 306 British soldiers that were executed, put to death by firing squad, by their own fellow servicemen for the crime of desertion or cowardice i.e. refusing to go over the top when ordered to go basically commit suicide. 306 soldiers killed by their own for the crime of being cowards and not wanting to fight. Of course, since this is such a powerful and pervasive phenomenon, of course, there's going to be social engineering techniques to overcome it. Like the Order of the White Feather, started in August 1914 by Admiral Charles Fitzgerald and his wife, and interestingly, some suffragettes and feminists got on board, but it became a very popular phenomenon. The idea was that a woman would go to a military-age man in, in England, in London, and if he was not in uniform, put a white feather on him. He is a coward. He refuses to fight. It was a phenomenon that took off. It became very popular to do this, and in fact was so effective that the British government started to worry because men who were employed in services that were in aid to the military, munitions or whatever, were not in uniform and were being labeled as cowards for not being in uniform. This was actually too effective a social engineering campaign, so the British uh, Home Secretary, Reginald McKenna, had to start issuing king and country badges that men could wear to show I'm not in the service, but I'm, I'm important, you know, this is important for the, the military. 
Uh, this is the type of social engineering that goes on to make people do things they do not want to do. And we can laugh at this as being crude, ridiculous, but are we really that immune to those types of societal pressures today? They won't look like this, but they'll feel like this. And whether bombs start dropping or whatever type of war is declared or undeclared, the societal pressure to be involved in that at least to go along with that, to support it in some way, support the troops, will be phenomenal. And people, maybe even people sitting in this room who think they can resist that kind of societal pressure, may not be able to. It's extremely powerful. But this is the point. It's an old sentiment. It's not startlingly new. It might seem corny. It might seem ridiculous. War is over if you want it? That's stupid. That's a pipe dream. Don't, don't, don't spend your days dreaming about that nonsense. Go and fight. But why? Why are they so scared of it? Why do they want you? Why do they spend so much time and energy and money and effort spent trying to propagandize you so that you believe in this cause? It's A, because no one really believes in it, it's just more BS from the same BSers that always do the same thing. And secondarily, well, because obviously they care about you and what you feel and what you believe and what you think. Your mind is the battlefield. And it's not about China and US, it's about every person on the planet and it's about conquering your mind, which is why maintaining our cognitive independence and not giving in to the idea that we have to fight anything for the benefit of some Kissinger-esque, horrible minion of some global order that we don't want. We have to resist that, and that is our power. Our power lies in our consciousness. So let's end this talk on a more positive note. Don't worry, even the British government will pardon you eventually, a century later, if you desert or are a coward. Thank you. Available now from CorbettReport.com. Oil. The 19th century was transformed by it. The 20th century was shaped by it. And the 21st century is moving beyond it. But who gave birth to the oil industry? And what are they planning to do with that power in a post-carbon world? How and why Big Oil Conquered the World? Watch the documentary for free or purchase a DVD copy at corporatereport.com slash bigoil. <laughs>